we okay? Yes. Hello, welcome to the discussion about the Filipino nightmare. With me is Director Lav <laughs> Diaz. Um, maybe we will start off to give some context about Lav Diaz's career. He has been working for a long time. This film is actually, I think, the first time you have been invited to the competition of an A festival. So congratulations, Locano, actually. <laughs> this is long overdue, in my opinion. Um, Lav has been making films since the 90s. Mm -hmm. And actually, it took a while, let's say, to develop your, the aesthetic for which you are now very well known. You started out in commercial production, basically, but it left you unfulfilled. Is that a way to put oh, yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. I just, uh, I just want to be free. So I started doing these lazy shots, <laughs> long, long lazy shots. You know, Malays are lazy. We hang out all day. You know. We sit under the trees for eight hours, so we walk for 12 hours all day. We, we make love 15 hours, so it's very long. It's a lazy filmmaking, so to say. Yeah. Well, I wouldn't call it lazy, but we can discuss it in detail <laughs> later on. Yeah. Um, but we could say that actually last year when you were president of the jury in Locarno, there was mm. also a screening of Batang Westside, mm. which had been restored and which one could say was the first of your long... Yeah, yeah. It's the first long film. Yes, which was five hours, I think, mm. around that. And following up that one was an 11 or 12 hour film, Evolution of a Filipino Evolution Family, family. Yeah. which I think we should also mention because it goes back in history, in Filipino history and overlaps with the subject of your new film. It's also... Yeah, it, it also dealt with martial law, just like... Uh, but it's within the 17 year mar uh, period of martial law, as opposed to from what is before, which is two years before martial law. And Badang West Side is post-martial uh, post law. The effect of martial law, the dysfunction, the displacement, as uh, you know, as a result of the 17 years of martial law or the 24 years of brutal Marcos years. I didn't intend it to be a trilogy, but it's a sort of a continuum. So from what is before is actually the start, and then the middle part is the 11-hour evolution of a Filipino family, and the last part is post-martial law, is Batang West Side. So it's a kind of continuum. So in Hollywood logic, you would call the new film a prequel to... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just like Star Wars. <laughs> and I'll make millions and billions just like Mr. Right. You know. um, but one could say your big subject actually is the history of the Philippines or the, yeah. the Filipino experience actually is mm. maybe even a better way to put it. Oh, as you called it yesterday in the introduction, the Filipino nightmare. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Marjola, yeah, it was a nightmare. It was the worst period of our history. Uh, it, was a, it was a very dark period. It was the, the worst cataclysm that happened in our history. Like tens, ten, uh, thousands upon thousands of Filipinos were tortured. They went missing during the Marcos years. And uh, until now, there are a lot of missing persons, desaparecidos, until now, yeah. <laughs> Um, and one of the things I find, because um, it's maybe a Western thing that people always first talk about, when they talk about your films, they talk about time and the extraordinary mm. length that they have. Mm. But my feeling is that what is more important for you when you conceive a film is actually the space. Right, right. Well, we have a very different concept of time. The Malay concept of time is, you know, the setting of the sun, the you know, sun rising, the 28 typhoons that visit us every year you know, how we till the field. Our aesthetic is how the rice will grow into gold. So we're more governed by space. We're an, a country of like 1,700 islands, a lot of water, a lot of islands, you know, millions of mosquitoes, you know, thousands of lizards. So it's, it's a country more governed by space, not time. It's a different concept of how we live life as we know it. Yeah. <coughs> but, 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 but I guess the sense of time is in a way also defined, you know, if you live in that space, mm. you, that there, there is a certain time dictated by the nature by which you are surrounded and which you struggle with. Is that? Uh, um, that the, the space in which you live. Yeah, 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 of course. It dictates. It defines the way you perceive uh, yeah, time. Yeah, uh, because your long shots, you know, it's also... Mm. to introduce how a person lives in the space. Yeah, that's how we live in the space, because uh, it's, really, it's really dictated, everything in Asia, especially in Southeast Asia, it's more dictated by nature. We're very fluid 
with, with how nature works on us as, a, as inhabitants of these very, very many islands, you know, the archipelago thing. So it's like, for instance, you, if you consider the fact that the Philippines is the most uh, typhoon-battered country in the world, we're visited by 20 to 28 typhoons, big storms every year, then our lives really depend on this thing, then the way nature works on us. Yeah, that's our time. Actually, one of your films, Death in the Land of Encantos, mm. it followed after the typhoon. It was yeah, shot yeah. in a place where mm. you had made films before, and after mm, the big mm. typhoon hit, you went back there, and it's, yeah. it, the landscape is mm. totally destroyed. destroyed yeah. And um, in the new film, actually, there are some landscapes that reminded me of that. Right, right. It's always, uh, there's this vicious cycle of regeneration and rebirth in our culture. So every, everywhere in the, in the Philippines, there's this destruction by the typhoon every year. And we, as, as inhabitants of these islands, we need to regenerate and create some rebirth in our lives. So the landscapes always change by these landslides, earthquakes, and typhoons. And there's this issue of this vicious cycle of regeneration and rebirth. Yeah. Yeah. When you are developing a film, mm. do you start out with the spaces, or do you start out well, with? Uh, I always look for locations, and locations uh, became always as a, the template for aesthetics, so to speak. You know, the, the the location that I found for a certain project would become the template for aesthetics. I would create a story around it. It's so being dictated by nature also. <laughs> nature is a big actor in my films, in my cinema. Yes. Yeah. But, but so one could say you, you first have to have the locations to generate an idea of the script? I search for locations, mm -hmm. if there, if, even if there's a script. Like with From What Is Before, I'm looking for a place where it looks like the late 70s, uh, mm -hmm. late 60s, I mean, and the early 70s. And we found this place in the northern part of the country, which is a very neglected place. It still looked like the 60s, like the 70s. It's totally fucked up, yeah. So we went there to shoot this, uh, yeah. We didn't change anything. There's no, mm -hmm. there's no r real, you know, design to do yeah. to change this thing. It's, just, it's there. It's just there. Are, are there many places like that still course, in the Philippines? Yeah. Yes, so yes, you yes. could do time travel, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then you there's leave a lot the of urbanized that. areas. Yes, there's a lot of that. It's uh, the issue of neglect is very rampant in our culture. Mm -hmm. It's a totally fucked up culture. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, what, let's say once you have the space, how do you then start to develop a story? Or I have, I always have an idea when I start a film, so I work on that. It's a very fluid thing, it's very, very organic. I write the script every night and we shoot the film mm -hmm. the following day. And we don't rush things, you know, two scenes a day. Okay, yes. A single frame for 24 <laughs> hours. You know? We'll just be having coffee waiting for the bird to pass by. So that's why you're so popular with actors, because it's a very relaxed shooting. Yeah, yeah. We, you know, but actually, we just hang out. <laughs> <coughs> yeah, that's one, what one of your collaborators told me yesterday, that actually it's a very happy experience shooting, although of course, the yeah. films themselves do not give that happy an image. Yeah, yeah. We wait for that. We work hard on our aesthetics. You know? We don't rush things. We wait. How, how do you work together with the actors? Do they give input back to you yeah. on how to... Well, I, I always work with people that I trust. They are here, Peter yes. you know, Hazel Horencio, Evelyn. These are friends, you know. Yes, many of the actors yeah. actually... I, from I can always fuck them up. So they, <laughs> they are already used to it because you <laughs> fucked them up on previous films. Actually. No, they, know, they know my methodology, they know my framework, they know how I... We work together, it's a very good collective, you know. We, we work hard together. We're a group, we're a commune. Yeah. Yes, and yeah. everybody basically has to do several functions yeah, yeah, often. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're, uh, you know, they're a workforce and I, you know, they're good. I, I can trust them, they can trust me. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I like a lot in the new film is that in the first shot, a voiceover comes in that says this, mm. um, that this is the history based on memories, but also based on real facts. Yeah. But, but I'm very intrigued by the voiceover itself because it's not attached to a person, basically. At least that was my impression. But it almost feels like it's this collective memory. It's yeah. a voiceover that represents what the whole yeah. country has gone through. It's an abstraction. It, it's, it represents so many things. Maybe me or the village itself or the country, the motherland or some 
other voice, you know, it's an abstraction of, it's a composite of so many voices, but it's about us, our collective memory, our very selective and dysfunctional memory mm -hmm. of what's, what has happened in our country, in our psyche. Yeah. It, it also reminded me of something you once told me, that because in your films you read a lot, there's literature and historical works that influence your work, but you also once told me that when you go through the country, you try to meet older people mm, mm. and listen to their memories, basically, because this yeah. oral history is very different yes. from what you can find in the official and written history. Yeah, they're totally different. Oral histories are totally different. And it's, it's always in opposition to what we read, what we know. So it's important to commune with people, with, uh, especially the old folks. They have, mm -hmm. they have their own history. They, are, they, they, they really give you some sense of uh, footing on real places, real earth, or you know, a kind of aesthetic that's missing in what we know. Yeah. So uh, is there also when you talk to these people, like you already mentally take notes, like this person told me something I had never heard yes, before. Yes, I yes. have to. <coughs> yes. Excuse me. No, no, yes. <laughs> There's a lot of that. You, 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 it's like, it's like documentary where everything is about discovery. You, mm -hmm. you move and move and there's a lot of discovery. Yeah. That, that is also something that I find very intriguing about your work is that there is this like almost documentary aspect in how mm. you mm -hmm. show the landscape and the people moving through it, but there's also like a fantastic level below it, like mm. this mythic impression mm -hmm. that the people have of themselves and also because the situation is so fucked up mm. that it has an almost surreal quality by itself. Mm -hmm. Is that something you strive for? This no, you, you, have to, you just, just have to be very mm. instinctive and very primal about it. You just you know, be very fluid about it. Embrace what you hear, what you see, and move on, you know. Mm -hmm. It's very organic. It's a kind of organism that grows and grows. Is it also, you, you have often said that you kind of almost uh, felt that you had no other choice but make films that deal with the history of the Philippines because it's yeah. so badly communicated that as an artist, yeah. you have to try to bring some form of enlightenment. Yeah, it's, it's an ethical issue for artists. You, know, you have to be very, very responsible, especially in a community, in a, in a nation like the Philippines where it's totally, everything is mixed up. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody owns his own history about us. So there's a sense of responsibility every time you make a film. The medium is a powerful tool to revise things or maybe to correct things. Yes. So, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm trying, I'm struggling to be very responsible with this medium. Yeah. There is also in the new film, I have the feeling there are some archetypal characters that keep mm. recurring through your work. Like you very often have the abandoned child, you mm. have the crazy woman, mm -hmm. you have a priest, you have a person, often military person, mm. that stands for the despotic new yeah. regime. Do you yeah. feel that these are characters basically that define something about the Filipino? Yeah, it defines our culture. You, you mix myths, because uh, uh, our culture is very prone to myth making, like mm -hmm. Marcos, a hero, God thing. So you have to negate all these things through a mix of metaphors, philosophy, poetry, or some fuck up dog somewhere. <laughs> there. So it's a mix of that. Uh, you're, you're a visual juggler, you're a storyteller. You're, you, you do narratives that at least approximate reality or truth somewhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it is now actually, one thing that I'm intrigued by is how you keep returning in the last few films to the whole problem of the Marcos regime. Yeah. Your, your last film, Norte, basically it was uh, in a way also an adaptation of crime and punishment, mm. but it was also like the genesis of this fascist character mm. that, that defined the idea how Marcos saw himself mm. and how he basically put the Philippines Whoa. under his command. Under it's just that, you know, fascism is a hovering, hovering phantom in our lives. Mm. Not just the Filipinos. Everywhere mm -hmm. it's like, it's, it's, everything is very fascistic. Everything is very feudal. So I always go back to that metaphor, you know, metaphor of Marcos as this uh, evil guy who's who fucked up, mm -hmm. our, you know, our psyche. Yeah. Um, there is one anecdote you told me yesterday, which I think would be very good <laughs> if you could mm. tell again, because I find it really fascinating and it gives an idea of this whole nightmare thing. And also it has to do with both Marcos and cinema, mm. namely that when Imelda Marcos, who always wanted to have a film festival, when they set up the first mm. Manila film festival and what happened there. Yeah, it's been, it's been, it's been uh, it, it, they're starting to tell the stories now. 
a week before Imelda Marcos uh, mounted the totally fucked up film festival, it's called Manila International Film Festival. So they, they rushed this building called Film Center a week before the festival, because they ru they're rushing the building, some sections of the building collapsed, burying more than 200 workers. And so Imelda has to cover everything, fresh cement. And a week later, everybody was dancing. George Hamilton was dancing with Imelda. Von Clyburn was doing his uh, Beethoven and Mozart there. And there are like 200 lives there buried. And the military cordoned the area so that nobody can talk. They sent agents, military agents, to the families of those of the victims so that they won't talk. They were paid millions so that they won't talk. So it's it's a nightmare. Somebody has to tell the story because uh, they're, they're still keeping this thing, you know. Yes, you told me that the building still exists it's totally and it's like a ghost house, basically. Yeah, it's now. it's it's a ghost house. Now. It's a it's it's a phantom there near the Manila Bay, and. A part of the building is being used by transgenders. They have this show every night there. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's surreal. <laughs> yes, uh, it's it a very farcical. Yeah. It's the automatic surreal. Yeah, yeah. But, but then, the, the, the surreality of the thing is the evil that's been done there is not yet open. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's like a myth now, but it's true. Lives were, you know, fucked up in that building. And it's a phantom that keeps coming back to us. We couldn't face this. We couldn't confront these realities, these truths. Yeah. Marcos, you no, know, Imelda Marcos is still a congresswoman. The son is a senator. The, the daughter is a governor. They're still there. They're still dancing in the streets. And the money is still in Switzerland. Here we still have $29 billion. That Marcos took out with him. Last year, yeah. We have money here, yeah. <laughs> please give it back to the Philippines. <laughs> <laughs> the banks here, please open it up. Yeah. Yes, but I think the story also it illuminates how brutal this regime is. And one thing yeah. that always strikes me in your films yeah. is because I know you are one of the nicest and softest persons <laughs> I ever met, but, but you have these really horrifying scenes in your films, mm -hmm. which I feel are, of course, because of the necessity to yeah. depict the cruelty of the regime. But how do you shoot those kind of scenes? Do you plan them out? Because you also, you do not do upfront full-scale violence. You have a very... Yes, I, I want to be very... Not, I, it's more of a mythology framework. I don't want to show violence, but at the same time, you can just feel it. It's a primal thing for me, yeah. I don't want to show it, but it's there. Uh, yes. You can feel it, yeah. I, I mean, the final scene from what is before, mm. for instance, that is very yeah. violent, right yeah. down to the last cut, yeah. which comes really <laughs> mid. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's the goal. <laughs> Horror is not seen, really, yeah. Horror is just within us, yeah. And, and one of the things I find very unusual about that scene, actually, is that because it plays out for so long, mm. that one element that comes up in the end that you feel very strongly is actually the boredom of the torturers. It's like mm. now they, that they've begun to torture, it, it doesn't even give them anything anymore. It's just to yeah. do it, like, mechanically. Yeah, it's barbaric. Yeah. It's evil. It's <laughs> animal. It's primal. <laughs> we have that, everybody, you know. Once you're in control, once you're in power, you can actually do that. Uh, two short questions. Uh, the first one, because we are not uh, in Europe, we don't know very well uh, the political situation in the Philippines. Mm. Uh, the first question is, uh, do you feel really free to say what you have to say, which is very uh, harsh? This is the first question. And <coughs> the second question is, uh, is there any chance that you could uh, um, diffuse your films in Europe uh, for me, I'm French, for an example, mm. and I'm sure that we feel in very near spirit with your spirit, even if the civilization is very different, because we have also our ghosts who are floating around us mm. from last wars, colonialism, and so on. Yes, yes. And I'm sure that you would uh, 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 light a spark in the heart of people in Europe because we have many in common mm. on, 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 course, on yes. the soul part, and I wish that you could uh, diffuse your film, and for that, would you accept, for an example, I think to, uh, for an example, TV like Arte and so on, that could diffuse your film, but cutting them in... Yeah. <laughs> you mean like a mini-series? my question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're a programmer, yeah. For the first question, yeah, freedom is an inherent right. I can say my piece anytime, yeah. Yeah, it's an inherent, you know, right, so... It's a mandate to be human, to say the truth, and to say the things that you want to say. And for the second question, yeah, you can cut it off, but don't 
fuck up the film. <laughs> <laughs> Show it in chapters, you know. It's okay. <laughs> you know, yeah. It's a good thing that we can, you know, reach some people out there, yeah. Yes, but uh, maybe we should also talk about that. Although you are free to say what you want to say, it is not easy for you to show your films yeah, in the Philippines because yeah. there's no circuit, basically, yeah. for that kind of cinema, mm. right? Mm. Yeah, it's still hard to have uh, venues in the country, so we're not actually, we're not able to show these pieces to a lot of people, only in the academe, in some intellectual quarters, you know, some, you know, pseudo cinema tech so yeah it's still hard to show the film especially that they're so used to watching the so-called hollywood you know praxis of two hour one and a half hour thing it's hard it's a struggle but it's slow 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 process it's gonna grow anyway struggle anyway yeah um <clears throat> Another thing that I'm intrigued by is uh, you've been shooting digital now for 10 years, mm -hmm. uh, maybe even longer, and your films look really, really good. <laughs> How do you achieve that? Because it's not normal. You, you also have an idea like I'm thinking mm. of the scene of the boat ride mm. in the middle of the film, and there was a similar scene, I think, to remember in Norte, mm. where you take full advantage of the digital image because although it is very flat, the digital image, you still see all these different mm -hmm. layers of nature moving back behind it. Yeah, I'm, so, I'm, I'm also a student of uh, modernism, so I embrace technology, so I study the digital thing every day. <laughs> I read, read a lot about things, you know. I, I, it's a tool that you, you have yeah. to embrace, you know. The revolution is about that, you know, understanding the tools, you know, so that you can fuck people yeah. up. <laughs> <laughs> and, and again, you always, you, you always use black and white, except for Norte, mm. intriguingly. The last yeah. film was in color, <laughs> that was very shocking. Yeah, How yeah. did that come about, well, that choice? I mean, color is an actor like nature, basically. Norte, you know? I went back to color because, uh, again, um, the location. We were looking for locations for the film, and when I saw uh, the, the location, with the northern part of the country where Marcos grew up, it's really beautiful, the place, you know, the luminance, you know, the, the hues, you know, the rays of the sun, it changes, the, it varies, and, you know, I will just have to embrace what's given to me by nature, so, yeah. Fuck black and white for <laughs> now, yeah. yeah. But is there a reason why you generally prefer black and white? Well, it's another way of saying things. I, j I just really love black and white. <laughs> There's no ideology about it, on it. It's just, I, I just love black and white. It's another way of seeing things, yeah. I grew up watching black and white, so cinema, so I love mm -hmm. it, you know, it's, it's in this thing. <laughs> it's in my psyche, it's the subconscious <laughs> that's dictating me. You can no longer escape that. I'm very selfish <laughs> about it, I want to watch <laughs> black and white films, so. <laughs> do you try to watch <coughs> color films in black and white? Do you turn yeah, off I the color? Yeah, I do that, I do that. <laughs> <laughs> See, that, expla <laughs> that explains everything. And sometimes I put up the sound, <laughs> <laughs> silent films, <yeah. laughs> Um, another scene I would like to talk about, because I find it very intriguing, is near the end of the film, what is before, when the two friends are talking and are remembering their youth and are talking about the rituals that they lived through, mm. which were the same, which were old rituals, and I think the way the phrase in the film is before the Christian and the Islamic Islam religion came, came mm. in. Yeah. I, I feel that is a very important point yeah, for the understanding. Yeah. In, in, from what is before, we were trying to reclaim what's been lost has been banished by colonization mm. um, and, and then by the coming of the ideolo ideologies yeah. mm -hmm. and the coming of religion. The three, the three rituals that you see in the film, the burning of the dead, the shaman uh, uh, and reaching the villages to, to, to treat people, and the chanting, you know, the storytelling, how they grieve when someone is dead. These are all gone now, banished traditions in our country. These were banished by uh, the Sharia law of Islam in, our, in my province. And we're trying to reclaim it. A lot of, a lot of uh, young uh, cultural workers in the Muslim areas, mm -hmm. Muslim artists are trying to reclaim these uh, Malay rituals, pre-Islamic, pre-Hispanic mm -hmm. rituals. We're trying to reclaim them. But, for, but, you know, for our culture, yeah. But, but banished, not, not, they have not been outlawed, they, are, they have just been They're, forgotten? They've been outlawed, they've been they, outlawed. They outlawed. outlawed they've between. been outlawed, but the artists are trying to preserve mm -hmm. them, they're trying to fight, you know, the system, yeah. Another thing is, you, you have used in previous films often historical records, materials. Here in this new film, there is, of course, the speech by Marcos, mm -hmm. where he's mm -hmm. declaring martial law. Is that an original? Yes, an yes. original recording of the speech, yeah. I could have put 
the whole thing. But it's so evil. How long is it? It's so evil. It's really horror. Yeah. His voice is really horror. You know. Horrifying, I mean. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, <coughs> but um, when you say you try to reclaim something, is that also the reason why you set the film basically in the three years or two years before? That yes, yes, yeah, yes, be yes. Before the declaration, basically, mm. because that really made it something else, right? Mm. I want to have that feel of anachronism in the film where you can see a certain, you know, negation of, you know, of what's the present. So I want to reclaim what's been lost, like what I told you, so, yeah. And do you feel that the moment the declaration of martial law made it even more evil in a sense? Because Marcos yeah. had been in power then for strangely, six or seven years already. It's strangely, it's during that period, everything happened. You know, the confusion, the banishment of traditions, the cunning of militarism, the enhancement of this very feudal, feudal and fascist system, and the cunning of the, you know, the revolution of the left, and the secessionist mo movement of the Muslim. Everything colluded during that period. It's really crazy. It's so mixed up. Yeah, it went by by 1973. It was so bloody all mm -hmm. over the place. Yeah. And you mm. also, uh, it's something you emphasize very strongly. You know, the rise of the military. Mm. Yeah, yeah. It, it became a culture now. It's a very dangerous culture in the country now. They they really control the part. The, you know, part of our, of our political system is very much. Uh, the a militaristic ideology, mm -hmm. <coughs> and and it's still the same way, basically. Yeah, we're we're, we're free, and we're at the, and at the same time we're not free. <laughs> this is kind of you know confusion, the kind of contradiction in our culture. Mm. I'm really fascinated by your character, like you were an adolescent in your tens when Marcos mm. took power. Well, when martial mm. law was declared. And obviously, there's a striking in every film you show. Mm -hmm. But how do, did you become the person you are, the author, other than the filmmaker mm. you are? What has been influencing you uh, by reading, watching, uh, mm. thinking, to become a 50-something-year-old, <laughs> I would say, modern Philippine philosopher, then filmmaker, then author, then citizen of the world? <laughs> I don't know, I just read a lot. <laughs> I'm just trying to, str I'm struggling to understand my culture, that's the thing. I'm, I mean, I'm trying to be very responsible as an artist also. I think it's as simple as that, maybe. Yeah. I, I observe a lot about our culture. I wanna, I wanna be very responsible. It's the ethical issue of doing things, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Although your films are very recognizable, there are always fluctuations in style. I mm -hmm. feel that, you know, that there are some films that use almost only long shots. There are others where you go in for close-ups and so on. Mm -hmm. How does that, is that developed during the shooting? Or? It's, it's very ex instinctive. I just mm -hmm. follow, it's very primal actually. I don't, I don't, I, of course you always uh, get trapped to this theoretical discourse every time you do a frame, you, you create a story. But at some point, you have to all, throw all these things. Just be primal about it. Just follow the threads that you know that's being dictated by the characters or by the flow of the narrative. You know, articulation comes that way for me. Just being fluid about it. Yeah. And as your own cinematographer, mm -hmm. do you have ideas there as well? Is there sometimes yeah, it, a love the director <laughs> fighting yeah. with love the cinematographer? Yeah, that's why they, they class the director, the writer. You know. <laughs> the totally fucked up person and the cinematographer. It's, just, it's a question of, you know, balancing things. And laugh the editor is then the one who has to mm, bring it mm, all under the head, yeah, basically. Again, again, there's the question of you know, the post-production. <laughs> the greatest struggle is when you sit down and just connect these things, put a rhythm on it, you know. Um, you said that shooting took like eight months for this film. Right? Nine, this month, this film is nine months. Nine months since pre-production. But but including post-production and so on. Yes. 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 Mm -hmm. And how long is the editing process, for instance? I've Just been editing since <laughs> I've been editing since February la, this year. So it's, okay, it's a long so it's process, like yeah. four months. Ha half of the time mm, is the editing yeah, process. Yeah. But you start editing already while you are shooting. Yeah. Or? During yes. the shoot, I'm already editing. Yeah. So you also sometimes go back and. In include other stuff that you see yeah, when you edit? Yeah, it's you always a it? process, because uh, before the film 
came here, uh, two weeks before that, we're still adding scenes also. We're adding scenes. If I see things that's still lacking, then mm -hmm. we go back and shoot. Okay, so you're very quick you're at the same together. time. You're you're together. Together. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Another thing that is in this film and in many of your films is there are scenes with music and with poetry. Mm. And you started out actually writing poetry, I think, and mm -hmm. also you're a musician. So yeah. are these things that you write yourself? or? Yeah, it's, it's a cinema. Filmmaking is really a constellation again of so many things. Being a musician, being a poet, being a writer. It's, it's a composite of all these things. Cinema is, is so, so huge that it, it compasses all this medium. It can embrace anything. Yeah. So is that also what drew you ultimately to cinema, the chance to combine these yes, different yes, aspects? Yes, yes, yes. I don't even understand cinema. <laughs> so <just laughs> well, nobody understands cinema <laughs> really, but everybody... I'm still trying to understand to cinema, so... <laughs> <laughs> so you see your films as a learning curve? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> understanding cinema, studying <laughs> cinema. It's, you know, it's, a, it's a continuum, everything is a continuum. The whole process, the whole framework, the whole methodology. But are, are there any directors you would say that they brought you also in a way to cinema, that they helped you realize what cinema can achieve? Oh yeah, a lot of influences. The French New Wave, uh, Rossellini is a big influence, you know. Tarkovsky, all these guys. Yeah, in Tarkovsky, our country, you know, Broca, Bernal. You have to, yeah, all these deludes of influences, they come handy when, you, when you're doing things. You're not even aware that you're copying things after a while. <laughs> No, that's not the same, but yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, but how do you feel? I, I mean, is it possible, as you mentioned, Filipino directors, I mean, Lino Perocca, or Bernal mm. are still known, but uh, m much of Filipino hi film history has vanished, actually. Or do you still right. have access to that? History. You the, mean the cinema? Yeah, I mean, many the of the films are gone. Yeah, we have a very, very bad, you know, archiving practice in the country. We don't, we don't have a film archive yet. It just, it's just starting this year. So we, we lost. The golden age of Philippine cinema, they said during the 50s, 90% of the works are gone, so we don't have those things. You know. we, a lot of the good works have uh, gained mythical status because we don't see them. People talk about it, but we don't see them. The good works of the 50s, the 60s. So it's also just based on memory. It's another memory and yeah. oral history translation. Oral history, yeah. 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 People Which saw them, oh, this is the greatest Philippine ci <laughs> Filipino film. But then you, j you just see stills and some people talking about this thing. You know. It's but sad, you know, but it's yeah. this, it speaks a lot about how we handle things. Everything is neglected in our country. But, but uh, one could say that one could see that as part of your project to reclaim history, for instance, in Evolution of a Filipino Family, you made mm. Lino Broca a supporting character, basically. Yeah, the it's, it's, it's the another, character. another way of reclaiming the past, you know. We have to immortalize what he did. We have to pay homage to what he did to us. Mm -hmm. He was a great voice during the struggle against Marcos. He was an artist and an activist. Yeah. Uh, you um, spoke before about how people in, in the Philippines are used to watching Hollywood films. That's mm. the Until now. vocabulary they're used to. Um, but your framework is very, very uncompromising. Um, mm. You don't bow to that appetite at all. Mm -hmm. uh, what we haven't really heard a lot about is the use of time in your films, which is the thing that we all know about them, mm -hmm. is that they're very long. And um, I wonder how that's important to you, how you feel time works for you. What, what, what happens over those three, five hours that you couldn't <laughs> do in 90 minutes? Uh, how did you experience it? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, 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 it's always, you know, when I started doing this praxis, so you have to destroy all the systems, like, you know, Hollywood is such an imposing, you know, if I put it, it's, a, it's such an imposing system in filmmaking. It's almost the it thing, you know. So it's hard to fight it. <clears throat> I'm, just trying, I'm just trying to make my cinema, I'm just trying to liberate my cinema from that, the clutches of the system. It's as simple as that. Yeah. 
Um, I wanted to follow up on the previous question about time because I also remember there's like this hidden part of your filmography because mm. everybody keeps talking about the epics, but in between you've also made some short or medium yeah. length films. How do you deal with that? What qualifies a film for? <laughs> the, 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 the short and the long. I don't really believe in the length, so there's no short film or long film. Yeah. It's just cinema. <laughs> if it's one minute, it's one minute. It's cinema. <laughs> if it's 12 hours, then it's 12 hours. It's still cinema. <laughs> You know, yes, it's like Heiko and Ilya, the long <laughs> poem and the, the short. short film. It's the same, they're all poems, you know. A and also I have the feeling your idea of cinema is very all-encompassing. It, right, it doesn't right. have to be a projection in the cinema for you, Yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. No, it's nowadays you can have all the venues, you know, you can watch them in your homes, you can show them in the toilet while you're doing <laughs> the thing, yeah. You just put it there, you know, the USB thing. So. Cinema is part of our lives now. It's just everywhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes, but I've also we're all watching cinema now. So <laughs> we're right, part of it. Right we're now, part of we are, it. We are put cinema. yourself out of the frame when there's this existing thing. Yeah. No, but I was reminded also of that because when mm. this gentleman previously talked about, uh, like uh, showing your films like a mini series, you know, which is now right, a very right. widely accepted format. Course, Basically, yeah. it's kind yeah. of strange that just because your films are normally shown in the mm. cinema, they would be treated like something right. shockingly out of the norm when it's actually quite normal mm -hmm. because of other developments. Well, the, the cinema, cinema also can adjust to conditions of everybody. If, if a guy can just watch it in chapters, then yeah. do it in chapters, <laughs> yeah. A another thing I wanted to know is how do you come up with the titles for your films? Is it a long process or is it sometimes yeah, that sometimes you know immediately? Sometimes they come easily, sometimes they come, you know, Really hard. Yeah, it's a long, long struggle. So How was it with this one? With what is before? Well, is I came. I I've been looking for a title of this uh, idea, and then I came upon the the philosophical line a priori, mm -hmm. and then the, the the English translation is from what is before. Then it translates very much. It articulates what I'm looking for before. with this yeah. film. So I use it. <laughs> I, I also like the idea, may, maybe you could make a whole series of films just using philosophical terminology for the yeah, titles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Would that work for you? Yes, <laughs> of course. <laughs> Philosophy is really, really good for cinema. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the search for the truth is part of <laughs> the process always. Mm. Aestheticism is about that. Searching and searching, digging for the truth. And philosophy is like that. It applies so much to cinema. Yeah. The idea of the search also, I feel, is a very central thing for your filmmaking, yes. actually. It may that also have to do with why you take so much time? Because if you want to search something, if you want to get to the bottom of something, it mm. must take time. Yes, yeah, yeah. Redemption. <laughs> the age of redemption. You search and search and search. <laughs> Meaning, redemption, liberation, all the struggles, yeah. Mm. Um, I noticed that you always refer to yourself as Malay as opposed to Filipino. Is, is that a choice to align yourself with like I get it, so claiming the past. We're, we're not Filipinos, we're Malays. The yeah. Filipino thing is from King Philip of Spain. Filipino. It's imposed by the colonial thing. So I'm just being, I'm just trying to reclaim what's been lost. Yeah, yeah I like that. Malay, Malay. <laughs> and then another question is, um, like you're saying some really important things in your films mm. that you know a wider audience in the Philippines is we'll never see, and especially families like mine who have emigrated, mm. and you know, second, third generation Filipinos. Um, have you ever entertained the idea of making your work you know, more accessible? Well, the issue of accessibility is uh, a, a discourse on ignorance, actually. We have to destroy the wall of ignorance first, and then everything will be accessible. Mm. So it's an issue of you know, how you profess articulation in so many ways. Yeah. It will come. You know, it's a long process. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you consider yourself an optimist, a pessimist, or a realist? Everything. <laughs> Everything at the same <laughs> time. Every time every <laughs> you wake up, you have this different feeling. You're sad, you're happy, you know, you want to make love. So there are so many things when you wake up. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, but I, uh, I'm also asking because in your films, you know, there, there are many contradictions, but they feel to me course, they are yeah. the contradiction of the Filipino experience, mm. but sometimes there seem options of hope and sometimes it ends in absolute despair. Right, right. You know, it, it, it's just the fluidity of working that sometimes you just need to put this thing in the end. If it's pessimistic, then maybe it's asking for some rebirth. Mm -hmm. Yeah.
pessimism is a, the start of rebirth also, regeneration. Yes. Yeah. So speaking of uh, putting things at the end, uh, mm. that unforgettable line, long live the University of the Philippines, <laughs> when they are tortured in the end, yeah. <laughs> what, what was your inspiration well, to put that in? Or? So it's, it's very strange for some people, but you know, activism in the country is very much equated to people from the University of the Philippines in the country. It's a very particular thing in our struggle then. So a lot of activists came from the University of the Philippines. So I have to clear that, that it's, it's a very particular thing in our culture. The, the very ascent of, uh, of uh, activism in our country started in the universities, especially the, especially the University of the Philippines then, during the Marcos years, yes. yeah. And I think uh, there were actually some vocal protests at the university right during the time when your film is set, yes, before yes. the martial law was declared, yeah, 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 was yeah. part of the escalation, basically. Yes, they started all these things in, also in the UP. The first quarter storm, the start of you know, the left uh, movement to fight the system. There's a lot of that in the University of the Philippines. So it's a homage also to the struggle that started there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in your new film, From What Is Before, mm. I'm not sure, but I think during the five and a half hours, I counted two times where the camera moved, where the camera panned. Because mm. usually your camera, yes, it, yes. It's, it's still. Mm. And both times, it was a scene at the beach. But why was it exactly these two scenes that you chose to move, have the camera move? Well, the scene is associated that also. It asked for it, so I just followed. It's very instinctive also. I just followed it, yeah. And uh, a second question, if I may. Um, I believe your film is the longest film playing here at the Locarno Film Festival at five right hours now. and 38 yeah. minutes. But within your body of work, it is not even close to being one of your longest films. Right, you've right. shot films eight hours, 11 hours. Mm. So this is almost uh, a short film, actually, f for you. <laughs> uh, so my question is, how do you determine the length of your film? Is that something uh, no, you already no. know before you go in? No, or is that something that happens in the editing no, there's room? There's no premeditation. It's just, you know. The Pure I, instinct. I'm a slave to the process. If it's seven hours, it's seven hours. If it's five minutes, it's five minutes. No, no, no premeditation, no manipulation on the length. They just happen during the post-production, the editing. Yeah. Yeah. Does, does this also apply actually to the production side of the film? You just keep on shooting? Yes, until yes, yes. yes. yes, yes. So like uh, Evolution of a Filipino Family, yeah, we okay. shot it for like 10 years. So yes. <laughs> we just we need to, we needed to shoot and shoot and shoot and shoot, yeah. I have a question. Um, mm. How do you manage to finance these movies when they're so long, isn't that very expensive? And yeah, I would manage that, uh, think that will be hard. Most of my works, there's, they're low, low budget actually. So I, I grew up poor, so my films, I made them like a full man. So there's low, low budget actually. So. Yes, but I think we both would agree that rich and poor has nothing to do with yes, the value of, of the film. Of course, yeah, it's not yeah. a financial thing yeah. in the end. The budget <laughs> doesn't dictate the quality of the film yeah. uh, at the end of the day. Yeah. It's the work that you give it, the, the vision that you do. Yeah. Uh, in a Century of Birthing, there is mm. this shot of uh, a poster by, of um, uh, uh, What Time Is It Over There by Simon Leung. Simon Leung, yeah. Uh, I wanted to ask, uh, if you feel some kind of link with him, and yeah. if you think that his way of shooting uh, sh or shaping time, like uh, Tarkovsky said, is uh, linked uh, to the fact that your countries mm. have gone through something similar, even uh, Usia yeah. movies. Well, uh, timing line, I like his work, so it's just a homage. I put his poster there, so <laughs> it's a homage. <laughs> when we were together in, in Singapore, we just exchanged posters, so it's just a homage to a good friend. <laughs> And I like his films. He's a great filmmaker, Chiming Liang. Yeah. I just want to honor somebody who's also working hard for cinema. Yeah. Somebody who's pushing cinema to, to greater heights. So it's good to pay homage to people like him. Are there other contemporary filmmakers which, which, with whom you feel such a strong connection? Oh, well, Wang Bing is one. Mm -hmm. uh, my old friend Pedro Costa is one. So. It's cool. 
So you are looking forward to seeing his yeah, new film here? Yeah, we'll be having coffee there in the next few days. Yeah. <laughs> I'm waiting for him. <laughs> okay. Any more questions? Because otherwise we maybe close on this optimistic note now that we've achieved one. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Very good Thank, you. Thank you.